welcome to How to Find More Direct Clients Than You Can Poke a Stick At podcast, a mix of both solo episodes and expert interviews. Our ideal listener is an early career, ambitious, and passionate online language services provider. She is committed to professional growth and achieving success in the fiercely competitive translation and interpreting industry. She balances multiple responsibilities with resourcefulness, values mentorship, is open to learning, and investing in her professional development journey. She embraces technology and seeks to optimize workflow, eager to connect with like-minded peers and build out her professional network. She is determined to overcome challenges and become a sought-after freelance translator. And here's your host, medical translator and translator business mentor, Jason Willis Lee. Susanna Ray is an award-winning coach, writer, and speaker who's been bringing clarity, focus, and structure into small businesses and entrepreneurial startups for over 20 years. Susanna brings a unique perspective informed by her training in design and business strategy, her lifelong interest in psychology and strengths as an introverted online business builder. Her book, Courses and Mentoring have been the catalyst for growth for clients who've integrated Sparkle frameworks into their business. She helps the unseen be seen, heard and respected. Susanna is based in the United Kingdom and has been serving clients globally online since 2002. Welcome, Susanna Ray, to the show. Our show is called How to Find More Direct Clients Than You Can Poke a Stick At. How are you today? <laughs> I am doing well. I love that title. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Great to see you. Thank you very much for your time and coming on. Uh, yeah, when we set this up... Um, in our last call, we had a very nice call. That was a longer call. We agreed to talk about online presence. So I I have a course product offering that I'm actually launching next week. And I teach my, my people. They're all service providers. They're all online language service providers. So that's translators, interpreters, copywriters. I think there may be a few as well about online presence. And I teach them SEO, a bit of basic SEO strategy, their meta tags, their alt text and I teach them that, I try and get them to think about a lead magnet and opt in into their into their websites. What's your take on this? How how important is online presence and visibility for service providers? And you and I both provide, we're slightly more entrepreneurial, but we still work with providing a service. Absolutely. Um, how important is online presence? You kind of can't do without it these days. Yeah, agreed. So for me, it is top importance, where you wish to show up and how you wish to show up, that becomes the choice. But absolutely, the first thing anyone does these days is whether they want to refer someone or find out more about someone, yeah. they're straight there. They wanting to go online and find the details on their phone, on their computer. So if you're not online, how are they going to find you? It's difficult, isn't it? So it's the biggest business asset I mean, to leverage. I mean, I, I encourage my my people, my students, people I work with one-to-one -to, -one to get a, you know, they're either doing their first website or they're sprucing up their current website. We talk about putting an opt-in, some piece of content mm -hmm. that would be valuable for their audience. I mean, how do you, your own website, I've looked at your website, it's very nice. How do you leverage your own your own online assets? How do you do you force traffic intentionally to them through an SEO strategy or do you do anything else? For me, it's less about a forced SEO strategy. And mm. this is part of that I find if you're lucky, there's certain service business owners, and I feel your clients maybe do come into this, yeah. where there might well be set keywords that absolutely people are searching into Google. For, for many people in the service space, it's less about keywords and more about how you're showing up in your authority, in your space, and in different ways, like doing talks, presentations, workshops. And then it's more a magnetizing people to your website rather than pushing them in mm. because they've already heard the essence of what you're about. They've felt what your training or your service might be and they go, yes, I need that. 
So they're positively looking for you. So they're already a little warm. Yeah, warm leads. And I find mm. that works far, far better than sort of. A, and in fact, it's been interesting over the last like year, even Google has changed a lot of their algorithm of how they find people. It used to be all about keyword stuffing and people mm. are like, if I get the right keywords in there, that will be what it is. And yeah. now they have, and I'm just trying to um, remember off the top of my head, because what they've done is they've expanded what they want to look for in your website. Mm. And I've just got it actually on my computer because I don't want to misquote, is I was looking at this earlier this morning and rather than just being about keywords, yeah. it is really much about, they call it E-E-A-T. And that stands for experience, expertise, authoritiveness, and trustworthiness basically right. so e even yeah yeah e e a t so okay. and i think it used to be more just eat they just had one e and i think experience is something that they're looking more for as well and so this like increases the level of what they want to find on websites mm. it's not just about here's your services but write blogs and articles that show your perspective, your insight, and your expertise. So you might share client case studies in there as well. And that will increase your trustfulness because yeah. people are seeing like the reviews and testimonials. And there's all these different elements. I don't think there's now one thing that if you do that one thing, you're going to get traffic. These days, you kind of need a multi-pronged plan, basically. Mm. So, I mean, I I work with people, they're not quite sure what to talk about sometimes. So when I work with their content management, because that's what we're, we're doing, we're trying to, you know, find our voices online, work out what to talk about. I am a Score App user. I think you use Score App as well. Yes. So I've introduced Score App to my, in fact, next Monday, I'm interviewing uh, somebody from Score App in the sales and marketing department. She will come on on the podcast and tell us more about Score App. And I, I think it's fantastic. I did a deep dive survey a couple of months ago before Christmas, and I got about you know nearly 100 responses. And I got some very insightful responses. So I encourage my audience to use Score App and, you know, for just 20, 20 euros, which is what I paid. I think it's just a very cost effective I mean, do you use scorecard marketing in your business to qualify leads and get people through the door that way? Yeah, absolutely. And I've been running my using score app for, gosh, uh, probably 15 months now. So oh, wow. I was rather one of the early adopters yeah. when I came across it. And one of the reasons why I like it is because unlike other quiz facilities that there's lots available online mm. they normally just give an output like you're in group a b c or d yeah. and it's very sort of high level whereas the advantage of score app and i do this exactly it's both a lead magnet in terms of helping people think and mine is about their business spark score so it's understanding What's your level of authority in terms of working in three areas that I see as vitally important for experts wanting to show up? And this is the content you produce, mm -hmm. the connection that you're making. So that's connection, engagement, audience, and also the container in terms of where are you setting up your knowledge? Where are you holding this and then sharing and increasing your expertise? So my score app measures people on these three different areas. Mm -hmm. And what is beautiful about it is you can set it up in a really deep way that as the owner, you can go in and you can see all the answers to the questions. And yeah. if you set those up well, yeah. you can have little fishing questions in there. And one of the answers to one of my questions is I ask them the question, and one of the multi-choice answers is literally a hand raiser. Help, Susanna, I need help with that. Yeah. And 
I get about 30% of the people going through the quiz checking on that. Yes, I need help here. They want your help, yeah. And that's an open door for me to then be able to follow through afterwards and say, hey, I see you said you wanted help. What does that look like for you? So it starts the conversation mm. and you've got this background information that I might see, oh, well, I can see you're scoring highly on the connection piece, but your container and content are quite low. So this is where we need to focus. So you're bypassing a lot of those onboarding time and questions. It helps you become more productive, but you can also really lean into your clients a lot more and give a more personalized response. Yeah. And for me, that's kind of the secret of working online is how can you utilize all these amazing tools, techniques, whether it be AI or just mm. simple automations, mm. but keep your humanity in there, mm. that you're not turning into a robot. You're still yeah. showing you're a real person with a passion for your business and your expertise. Yeah. You love to help people with and make a difference. So yeah, absolutely. I use it for that. And also when people come into my mastermind, it's part of the onboarding process. And then we take it again, sort of six months in, 12 months in, so they can actually physically see how they've improved as well. Yeah, it's a powerful tool, isn't it? It's an audience quiz tool. And, you know, I, I have clients split testing different fields. I have a client doing education and medicine. Another client is doing literary, translation, commercial and academic. So we are devising different deep dives. So just a few four or five questions, a nice grease the wheels, easy question at the beginning, and then getting into those. And you obviously talked about the hand raiser post. I teach my clients how to just build a daily, you know, an engine of leads because lead generation is so key. You know, you've got your clients, the people you work with, but you're not, you need to fuel that. We all do. You do, I do, and my my audience does. So I teach them the hand raiser bow saying, hey, this is a, a thing I've finished and, you know, a, a thing I've prepared and, and they can see the benefit of that. Um, you talked about AI. I mean, what's the, I mean, the obvious thing, I'm getting a little bored of the AI debate, I have to say, it's a constant, it is important, but it seems quite fairly obvious to me that the solution is leaning into communities like the one that we're a member of, we're, we're a member of a mastermind, that's how we met back in London in November, and um, leaning into that human connection, which you mentioned, and that just seems to me the obvious solution. How can we kind of ramp that up in our in our content marketing? How do we how do we do what you said, which is saying we're humans, we're not a robot? How do we emphasize that and just reduce the chance of our work going off to the to the robot? Oh, there's so much to unpack in that question. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, where do we even begin? Where and, do we start? Yeah, exactly. And for me. And I was talking about this with someone just yesterday, actually. Mm. And it is this balance between AI is undoubtedly going to be growing and be with us in many of our businesses. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I still think no matter how advanced it gets to a certain piece, any I've yet to see any form of AI that has that element of conscience, mm. which I think is the essence of being human. So it might be able to do something, but should that be the answer? I think there's there's some really deep philosophical like answers that are coming up for me in this space. So when people are worried that, oh, well, AI is going to be like translating everything for me, but we all know that language is it's an evolving organism as well. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. every country's language, it's not stagnant. It's not something you can feed into a machine and go, that's how it's called. Every year, dictionaries come out and say, this is the new word of the year. And like, how yeah, do we use it? For sure. And so in the translation space, you need the human to be the sense check, to go well, that's a good starting point. And maybe it's like seeing them as a junior assistant, practically, that they get the ball rolling and they can get you moving fast. But then mm. there's something very unique about a human mind that can connect the dots and bring things together 
because it's not always and I mean you're the expert in this space but I know having lived and worked in several different countries in my lifetime that translations and even though Google Translate has been around a long time it's not that accurate sure. and you've got to know the setting and the placement mm. and I was always even very amazed when I read so long time ago when they first came out J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter books mm -hmm. and we've got the Philosopher's Stone. Yes. As it's called in UK British English. When it moved to the American market, there was a big anti or oh, philosopher that's too spiritual and witchy. You can't have this. Bear in mind, it's the world of wizards. But still, it wasn't allowed. And it's no, got a different I, title I in didn't know the that. US. What was the title in the, the Philosopher's Stone in the US? I didn't know it's, that. Um, oh. You can send it to me. We'll put it in the show notes. If you yeah, say. we'll put it in the show notes. I think it's something uh, more about it. sorcery. But mm. it was funny. It was They're like, you can't call it the Philosopher's Stone. Really? Um, I didn't know that. And there's mm -hmm. elements that were even translated, if you will, from British English mm -hmm. into American English for the American copy. So if you yeah. pick up an American version, it is different from the British version. So a lot of people think that even in English, oh, it's one language, but it's not. And then That's if you try, yeah, yeah, there's so much in this, and I just don't get how AI can understand those subtleties mm. in that space. And that is maybe one of the easier spaces sort of to lean in. And I think this is where whenever you're serving as a service owner, that you're training, you're doing a service for people, mm. it's about emphasizing that piece of dot connecting. Yeah. That makes it real. And that's the value you're providing and that's the value you need to focus on just bringing back to the start of on your website and social media is how can you show to be different mm. is a lean in to what you're thinking and your perspective. Because mm. if you're plugging something into AI, it's just down to your prompt and then whatever that prompt generates, yep. but that's not going to be good as your brain at the end of the day. Yeah, I love you talking about uniqueness because that's what we're all about, isn't it? Youpreneur, personal branding is leaning into this uniqueness of you. You are you and I am, you know, I'm me. Um, what, give us a couple of broad brushstrokes of your own branding, how you get your personality in. Now, you know, I should probably say, you know, we've heard it in the, in the introduction, your bio, you have a business which is to do with visual frameworks, a roadmap for business I mean your your audience is small business owners but it could could include service providers as well in your audience or is it just entrepreneurs um no it's anyone who's mm. in the business of transformation okay so if you're helping take people from a to b then that to me is how i define a service business owner so you're yeah. wanting to facilitate a change and quite often clients who come to me, they are working very much one to one. So they might have a simple package that they do A and it'll help them get to B. And it's in that space. Whereas mm. for myself, what I love to work with clients on is the first is it's about gaining clarity on what is their uniqueness. And I use my visual frameworks for this. And it's one way I stand out from the crowd because many people do lots of talking and I'm like, mm -hmm. no, let's get the pen and paper out. And let's draw this out. Yeah. And it's about seeing and how you connect the elements. And then once we've gained that clarity of knowing what is unique about who you are, who you serve, what your passion is and your experience, mm -hmm. how that comes together is how can we move that into serving more people for greater impact, which could be through courses, through memberships, speaking on stages, doing presentations, mm -hmm. running workshops. It's all about then talking to more people in a way that is simple enough for people to understand. So once it's understandable, it becomes shareable. And if mm -hmm. it's shareable, it's repeatable. And that's my goal, to help people have a framework 
that they can hang their hat on and go, yeah. yes, this is what I do. And what I find is those of us in this space, quite often you might have a title of a coach or a consultant, a trainer, a facilitator, a therapist, a psychologist, mm. anyone in this space. And it can feel really, really tough. Like yeah. going, I don't want to sell myself. I don't want to go, hey, I'm amazing. And like, aren't yeah. I wonderful? Because uh, particularly if you're British, it's like, we don't do that. We don't do bragging. Yeah. We're not like throwing yeah. yourself out there. But if you it create can a come framework, across as, as narcissistic, can't it? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. But mm. I find if we create a framework, a proprietary process that your business and services is based upon, yeah. suddenly we remove that dam and open the floodgates to, I can talk about this framework because it's now just sitting to the side of me. Mm. And I can say, I take my clients through this process and people then can engage and go, I want that. And yeah. it becomes tangible. Whereas when it stays within ourselves and within our heads, it's quite intangible and quite hard for people to grasp. And if something's intangible, it's very hard to sell. Mm. So how, I mean, how personal do we need to get our stories into the brand name? I'm just thinking of a conversation with a client and we said, absolutely, get your personal story. And she's positioning herself before a medical audience of medical people, hopefully wanting research articles, translated, that kind of thing. She was worried about an adverse health issue coming into the branding. And I, I was thinking, how do we put a positive spin on this and position her as an authority before her target audience? I mean, how... How, to what extent can we, do we get our, you know, how far do we take this? Can we get something perhaps that on the face of it looks negative, but if we put it in the context of our, of our branding, our products or service, that can be a good, a good thing, can't it? Because it's, you know, it's an experience. It clearly positions, um, you know, in this case, her as an authority on, on certainly on that, on that particular topic. So I, my feeling was that she should go for it and just weave weed the branding in. I mean, I, I just think that we all have lived a, lived a unique life and there's nothing you've lived that I could talk about and vice versa. So I, I just think it's the way to go. That That is the uniqueness of the business of you. Do you agree with that? Yes, I would say that stories are very, very powerful. Yeah, and definitely. as humankind, since the very first campfire was built, stories have been told. And all the way back, it, and once we ban, we managed to start drawing, we then have cave paintings to help pass on the stories to the next generation. So we know that stories are memorable. They mm -hmm. help stand out. Yeah. They help people relate as well. But the best stories are ones that aren't purely about you but you do pull in and weave in mm. your audience as well. So it's sharing the right moments. So I don't believe we need to share every biographical element of our life no. and put it into our business. It's more about picking those stories that reflect moments that your audience, your prospects will connect and engage with. And they go, oh, yeah, I was there too, or I know someone like that. It doesn't always have to be direct, but if they go, I hear that, I see that, that to me is the important piece. And it's what changes a biographical story into a story that converts. Mm. And that is something I also work on a lot with clients because like when you're running, if you are running a workshop or a masterclass or doing something online, yeah, there's quite often quite boring, should I dare say, intros when people say, oh, and this is me and I've won these awards and I've done that. And I'm like, there's more fun ways of showing what happened along the way and bringing your personality into it. So one of my clients is a drummer as well and I'm like we need to weave that in he's working in the mindset space and we've been building that into the brand and mm. he was like but isn't this really different I was like no that helps you stand out it brings your world into others and helps you just be slightly different because then the yeah. people who are maybe a bit more musical in nature they'll get drawn to you whereas those who aren't they all get pushed away. And actually it's that polarization 
when it comes to marketing is what we want. We mm. can't be fearful of pushing people away because if you push people away, the opposite is you draw people in. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. Yeah, I mean, storytelling is vital. I actually have a, a separate storytelling freebie for my audience, and I will do a separate podcast episode. I think first it's the first one of next month. I have it scheduled. So it's just it's just absolutely you know the mentors the the email lists the emails I receive and the lists that I'm on the ones that tell me a story are just the ones I immediately connect with more. So I'm trying to do this myself and encourage my audience to do this as well because it, it's just very powerful, as you said. Um, so just to finish up, I mean, a couple of questions, um, you know, final final couple of questions. What's 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 the best part of being you? What's something you would amplify? What's the best part of being Susanna Ray? How would you characterize that? I would say being insanely creative and the mm -hmm. dot connector. Um, the thing I love to do is to meet people from everyone, from the logical left brain to the completely spiritual healer and bring it into something physical and tangible and sellable. And mm. that just lights me up when I meet people and, and I see these things happening, yeah. which is why everything in my world, my mastermind is called the spark space because it's about igniting the possibility and I do that every time I talk to someone. I'll just see, I, I read between the lines of what they're saying out loud. And yeah, that, that's what I love. I think that's the essence of me is in, in, insanely creative at the end of the day. Have you got a book or resource that you can recommend to my audience? I mean, maybe, maybe along those lines, something creative or something that facilitates sparks flying and creativity and or, or any book in general? So when it comes to books, I mean, if anyone is listening and they're more introverted in nature, it would be rude of me not to mention my own book, which is <laughs> The Introvert Way Roadmap. Otherwise, I would get told off by my own business coach on that front. But when it comes to like having a resource, I would encourage people, actually, in terms of wanting to see where to ignite your business and where you should be leaning into, mm. do, and we'll pop it in the show notes, my Business Spark School Card, it will generate a bespoke report to the person. So what I find is better is when we lean into what do we need, there are many, many books out there. And one of my favorites recently, actually, I do read a lot of books, but there's one that I particularly like, and it is aimed at women, but I would say men read it too. It's a mm. great book. And it's called Playing Big by Tara Moore. Playing Big. I think I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. So Playing Tara big. Moore, it's M-O-H-R is her surname. And what's really nice is she leans into the stories we tell ourselves that stop us from taking action. And this is something I've been investigating quite a lot because why why do we have these ideas, but then we don't implement them? Mm. What is stopping us? And one of the concepts in her book that I really love and I've sort of grasped hold of with two hands is she talks about taking leaps and leaps in your business it's not about taking a decision. It's not even taking a decision within an action. It's actually about taking a decision, taking the action, mm -hmm. and then getting feedback on the action. So it becomes a loop. And that is how you make leaps forward in your business. And yeah. ideally, that is all done in Tara's words within two weeks. Two weeks. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's well, that. like go do it you know it's like yeah. and this is what I've taken on board with a lot of my clients that I'll challenge them and I had a conversation the other day with someone else and they're saying oh maybe I should do a LinkedIn live and I was like right so what date are you going to do it next Friday and they're like oh, it's in yeah it's published yeah. it's out there it's putting it into practice yeah it's not just about going, I'm going to plan about showing up for my business. I'm going to do a post. Like we can all do those internal decisions. It's putting the date in your schedule, yeah. treating it like a client appointment and doing it, being accountable. And that is how 
I really got going in my business, it was about five years ago now, is I said to myself, I am going live on my Facebook page every single Wednesday at 9.30. And I did. Quite often before I hit live, did I know what I was talking about? No, but it comes because actually inside ourselves, we know our stuff. Oh, yeah. We yeah. don't need a plan, but you need to make yourself accountable. What's the best business advice you've ever received? Create before you consume. Sorry, create before you? Consume. Mm. So lean in to the pieces you need to create because in today's world, we can all go down the rabbit hole of consuming stuff, whether it's books, podcasts, TV shows, social media, and we can get lost in that and lose our uniqueness. So for me, I always think about that every morning, I'll wake up and I will allocate like a golden hour of downloading the thoughts that are processed overnight before I open any social media, anything else, mm. and I'll do the download. So that is uniquely me. Susanna Ray, thank you for your insights on the podcast and for your time today. That was Susanna Ray. Stay on your game and I will see you on the next episode. All the best and see you then. Bye for now. Here's a fun fact about Jason. Jason is a big Star Wars fan. Thanks for tuning in to the How to Find More Direct Clients Than You Can Poke a Stick At podcast. We'll be back soon. In the meantime, why not head over to www.entrepreneurialtranslator.com to access all our tools and resources to monetize and future-proof your freelance translation business. And don't forget to hit the plus button in Apple Podcasts or iTunes, or subscribe in Spotify to be notified when new episodes drop. For regular tips and insights, business strategy, or marketing techniques straight to your inbox, please sign up at www.entrepreneurialtranslator.com.